Hey, welcome to South Bay Community Church. I want to welcome all of you who are watching online as well. Thanks for joining us uh, out, out there and also under the tent and in the lobby, perhaps. Uh, first of all, I want to just thank you so much for uh, praying for me for the results of my biopsy. Uh, it came back and uh, turned out to be benign. So thank you so much for that. I praise the Lord. And uh, I couldn't have done it without your prayers. So I really appreciate that so much. You know, if you ever go through difficult times like that, be sure to reach out and ask people to pray for you because it really does make a difference. Someone was telling me today, said, you feel so, you seem to be so peaceful. And I, I really attribute that to the, to the prayers of, of our church, that, that that's why I was so calm and so peaceful and uh, the results as well. Well, hey, I, I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. I just, by the way, we had a service last night and yesterday was kind of a hectic day, but kind of an exciting day. For, for me personally, because my daughter Natalie graduated from Pepperdine. <laughs> but uh, not only that, not only that, Maya, Maya Montez, who also attends the church, graduated from Pepperdine. Nicole Yee, who also attends our church, graduated from Pepperdine. And Hudson Cusipley, who's also, or uh, yeah, Cusipley, who's here. Said, well, where are you, Hudson? He, gradu- he got a master's degree from Pepperdine yesterday as well. So, um, hey, we're, all, we're sending everybody to Pepperdine, all right? So, so go to Pepperdine. Anyways, uh, so that was kind of exciting. But, you know, if you've been here with us for a while, we've been going through this series called um, What We Believe. And it's basically been um, kind of a mini uh, systematic theology course where we're just going through the scriptures and talking about the principles uh, of scripture. What, what do we believe about God? And what do we believe about Jesus? And we haven't gotten, what do we believe about the Holy Spirit and the church and on and on? We're going to cover all that. But for the last couple of weeks, we kind of hit the pause button on that series because we wanted to bring some people to you that just have really uh, stirred in us and touched our lives. Last week you heard from Mike and Nancy. What a great, powerful story that they have. And then today, I've been looking forward to this day for a long, long time because about a month and a half ago, I became friends with some very dear people. Um, Pastor Igor uh, and his wife, Lena uh, Yeremchuk, they're from Ukraine. And they are now living here, at least temporarily, here in Southern California. I'm going to let, te- let them tell you all, all about it. But Pastor Igor is the pastor of probably, he won't say this, so I'll say this. He's probably, probably the, the largest, uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, evangelical Bible-believing church in all of Eastern Europe. He's also the president of probably the largest seminary in Eastern Europe. And uh, he and his wife had to flee Ukraine because of the war that's going on there. And uh, they're here because they're here, because we became friends, fell in love with this couple. And you're going to see why, and I think you're going to fall in love with them as well. And uh, I'm going to bring them up here in just a moment because I want you to hear hear their story. I mean, it is absolutely riveting um, what they have to say. But before I do, I want to open up our time in a word of prayer, all right? So let's pray first. by the way, our, our, uh, our team that's been out in Israel is wrapping things up, and I think that they're going to be on their way home, if, if not already on their way home. And so let's, uh, let's keep them in our prayers as well, okay, that God would just take care of them. And, um, and then also just that God would speak to each and every one of us, uh, whatever it is he wants to say to the testimony of these two very special people. All right, so let's pray first of all. Father, thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> for your love for us, for your goodness to us. Lord, the story that we're about to hear today is so compelling, so real, so raw, so powerful. And Lord, you know, I've learned doing this long enough, I've learned that, you know, it doesn't matter how compelling of a story we have to tell or how powerful a message might be. It isn't, none of that matters unless your Holy Spirit really infuses that message with your power. And so, Lord, we, we invite your Holy Spirit to work right now in our church and through, through Igor and Lena, and I pray, God, that you would use them to speak to us and stir something in us. I pray, God, that you would even speak as they are online. This message is going out to a, a lot of people, and, and we'll sow for the next few weeks, maybe months, maybe years, pray that you would use what they have to say today to touch the hearts of literally thousands of people. 
And Father, so we're excited to gather here together as church. And by the way, Lord, we, we lift up our Israel group and we ask God that you'd bring them home safely, that you would protect them. And um, Father, I pray that you just be, I pray that you would allow everyone on that team to, to sense your presence and nearness to them right now. Bring a peace upon them and bring them home safely. But Lord, thank you so much. We're excited about what we're going to hear today. So bless our time. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So will you join me in giving our guests today, Dr. Igor or Pastor Igor and Lena Yeremchuk, a warm, warm South Bay welcome. You okay there? Okay. And um, we, we made sure they had a South Bay lay. And so we're so glad. This is kind of our Hawaiian vibe that we got going on. It's one of the things we got going on. But have a seat. And uh, gosh, it's so good to have you guys here. Thank you. This is our third and final service, and it is all, all the services have been such a blessing, haven't they? So, hey, will you, will you begin by just telling us a little bit about yourselves? Now, I've, I've told the church a little bit about you uh, over, over the last few weeks, but uh, maybe you can, I have not shared your testimony, and it's crazy. I know we don't have a lot of time, right. but uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you became Christians and how you got to this place where you're leading a seminary and a church. Uh, yes. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I like your picture of Ukrainian flag. Uh, it's, it's beautiful, you know. And, and it has two, uh, you know, two colors, uh, yellow and blue. Uh, yellow represents uh, fields because Ukrainian, it used to be breadbasket of uh, former Soviet Union, you know. We have lots of fields, uh, agricultural, you know, in Ukraine. And blue represents uh, sky, you know, heaven. Spiritually, you know, yellow, it's a mission field. And our job is to move people from yellow section to blue section. <laughs> so instead of being of children of, of earth, they'll, they'll become the children of heaven or children of God. And uh, uh, as you know, we came from Ukraine, and uh, in Ukraine we have different kind of ministries. The main ministry, I was a, I'm, I'm a pastor of the, of the church, uh, evangelical church in Kiev and uh, also president of uh, Irpin uh, Biblical Seminary. Our seminary exists for 31 years, and during this time we graduated more than 3,000 uh, students, and, and all of them are, like, I was, 95% of them are in full-time ministry. And uh, also, we are, we, Elena have, have uh, you know, women's ministry, and we have youth ministry, uh, evangelistic ministry, all kinds of ministries because we are so busy. And this is why we need you to come to help us. Uh, and, uh, you know, I became to be a pastor f since 1996. Uh, and uh, in Kyiv, uh, I am pastor of this church for 15 years. And last year, I became to be a senior pastor. And I'm a president of the seminary for uh, 14 years. And before that, I was vice president. And altogether, I'm serving in the seminary for 25 years. And Lena's dad was a founder and first uh, president of the seminary. So when he passed away, he, before he passed away, he, he turned seminary to me and uh, praised the Lord that uh, a seminary exists till now. Because even building, uh, you know, destroyed, but we say that seminary is not a building. The seminary is people. It's our students. And we have 830 students right now. And we believe that God will restore uh, buildings, you know. Uh, and that uh, seminary will continue to uh, exist, you know, but we need your help for that. And, uh, and, and we are so thankful that many people came and said that we, we're really looking forward to go and, uh, and work and uh, help to restore seminaries. So we appreciate for all your prayers. We appreciate for all your help. Uh, you know, it's incredible when God's people gather together. They can do everything with God's help. Yeah. Can we show a picture of the seminary? I think I've shown you a couple, but here's number five. If you could put that picture up. Yeah, it's a beautiful seminary, and I think one of the pictures I showed you was this building completely destroyed by Russian bombs. Um, I've shown that to you a couple weeks ago. And then you, uh, graduating class... Let's see, the graduating class would be um, number seven, is that right? Yeah. Number seven, and then maybe number nine. So they are doing a very, very good work there. And maybe you can show number 10, because this is what it looks like today. So tell us a little about how you became a Christian. And 
Lena as well. Yeah, uh, I'm so glad to be here, and it, I feel so welcome in your church. Thank you very much for uh, inviting us here. It's so special place to be here. Uh, I would like to share how I became a Christian because my testimony would be different from uh, some testimony you heard before. Because I grew up in uh, Soviet Union, and I grew up in a time when there was persecution in our country, when lots of people were in prison, and most of the churches were closed. Uh, but I had a privilege to grow up in a Christian home because I'm a third generation of Christian. My grandparents became a Christian through German Mennonites who was working in the field, uh, helping agriculture, and my grandparents became a Christian. Later on, my father became a Christian. He became a Christian during the time when my grandfather was arrested because they had a church in their home. My grandfather spent 10 years in prison in Siberia. And during this time, my dad became a Christian, and he was growing spiritually. And when I was born, my dad was a pastor. I was three years old. My dad became a pastor of our church. Growing up in a Christian home, it was a special blessing because we, uh, we had a Bible in our home uh, because my dad was a pastor. Not many people had a Bible in that time. Lots of people copy Bible by hand. Mm. And... For me, it was always nice not just to hear about Christ, but to see him alive in my parents' life. And I would like to uh, tell you that uh, so many of you, maybe you were born in a Christian home, but if you have not accepted Christ as a personal Savior, you'll fail a lot. It doesn't matter what home you're born, it's so important to have Christ in your heart. When I was 13 years old, I accepted Christ in my personal Savior, and I understood that whatever suffering, whatever I have in my life, uh, before I was thinking it's because uh, my parents are Christian. But when I accepted Christ as a personal Savior, I understood I could suffer for Christ. And it gave me strength, and I knew why I have this difficulty, because uh, God would like that there would be a light at school and every place where I would go. And because of the faithfulness of my parents and see Christ in them, I have three brothers, all of them are pastors right now. Mm. Praise God for this. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Uh, you know, I grew up in a non-Christian home. And I didn't know about God anything uh, until I was 22 years old. And when I was 20 years old, I was uh, in army, in Soviet army, because I graduated aviation uh, college. I was in helicopter as a mechanic and uh, door gunner. So during this time, we had a war in Afghanistan. So I was on the war, and this was the most difficult time in my life because every day you're flying between life and death. And most dangerous place to be in helicopter because everybody see you and you don't see anybody. Uh, and uh, my helicopter was on fire many times, and I was. And during these difficulties, uh, I started to pray and ask God for help. And uh, even I didn't know that people call this prayer. I just was asking God that uh, if He exists, that He will protect my life. And He really did. You know, very often it was very miracle things from God that I is still alive. When I came back home, I was looking for Christian literature in public libraries because I had no information about God. And I was looking for Bible or New Testament, but it was Soviet Union, it was atheistic government, and it was impossible to find any Christian literature in public places. So when I failed to find any Bibles, I decided to go from opposite uh, direction and started to read atheistic books in order to find maybe one logical proof that God doesn't exist. And I read lots of books and I couldn't find anything. Furthermore, authors, uh, you know, these atheistic authors, they, they quote Bible and try to criticize uh, these uh, portions of the Bible. But critics were so, uh, you know, weak. But Bible portions were so powerful. I understood that I am a sinner and I need repentance. And I got some knowledge about Jesus through atheistic books. So I'm so pleased and thankful to my atheistic friends. <laughs> who helped me so much in my process of seeking of God. So after that, I decided that there is no other way. From one hand, I had a practical experience that there is a God because he protected my life on the war by miracle ways. And from another hand, I had a theoretical experience uh, that uh, even enemies of God, they cannot prove anything against God. So I just kneeled down and prayed to the Lord and asked forgiveness for my sins, and I asked God to help me to start new life. 
So after this prayer, I had this feeling to look for Christian friends. But it wasn't, to it wasn't easy to find Christian friends because Christians were persecuted by government and churches were underground. But God helped me in this way because my mom came to the Lord. She had a Christian friend on her factory. And when I understood that mom became to be a Christian, I was happy for her from one hand. But when I understood that she became to be an evangelical Christian, it was like a cult, you know, and so many... <laughs> So many rumors were against evangelical Christians, some horror stories that they, that they drink blood, they, they kill children, you know, they, they eat people, you know, and stuff like this. In order to scare people just to think about going to the evangelical church. Uh, so I was, I was scared for my mom, and I decided to uh, take her away from this cult, you know. So one day she was going to the church on Sunday, and I was following her secretly, <laughs> that she will not see me, and I, and I hide it behind the tree, and I was watching how many people go into the church, it was just a private building without no signs, you know, and then I stayed there, this was cold, I was freezing to death, you know, but I stayed there for whole service in order to count, uh, count it how many will go out, <laughs> well, it was about the same number, maybe a couple people, they ate, you know, uh, but I didn't. I, I wasn't inside, so I, I have no idea what's going on there. So I waited when mom will be not able to go to church, because once in a while she was working on Sundays. So I went by myself. I know the way. I took big nail and put it in my pocket just in case, you know. And I walked in this building, and Christians, uh, you know, came to me and they started to say, "Please go forward," because lots of empty places at front. And I said, "Oh yeah, right." <laughs> I'm wondering why so many places, empty places at front. You probably would like to kill me first, you know. <laughs> so I sit on the back, close to the door, holding a nail in my pocket. But church service was wonderful, and uh, I understood that this is nice people, very friendly, and whatever I heard about them, it's complete lies. So I came home, and I told my mom that I've been in the church, and next Sunday I will go with her because I would like to come forward and confess my sins publicly, and I did it, and I became to be a member of this church, and then, past, and then preacher and youth leader, and when we received a little bit of freedom, uh, it was the end of, uh, uh, in, you know, 1980s uh, perestroika time, you know. Mm -hmm. It still was Soviet Union, but it was a miracle from the Lord that God allowed me to, to go to United States for education my church sent me to Chicago, to Moody Bible Institute. And I went to Moody by myself because government didn't allow to go my family with me. My wife and my daughter stayed at home because they were afraid that we never come back. So my wife, uh, you know, signed a letter that she will not apply for visa for four years. Otherwise, they will not let me go. Uh, and, you know, I think, yeah, it would be difficult for years, but, you know, with God's help, it's possible. It would be okay. After one week, I understood there is no way I will survive it, you know. It's not okay. So I started to pray that God will bring the rest of my family, you know. But, you know, I came to Chicago without knowing English. My English was zero. I thought they will have an interpreter for me. But nobody have an interpreter for foreign students, you know. So when I came to Chicago, I understood that I need to pass a TOEFL exam in order to study at Moody. I was so happy because uh, I so missed my family and I knew, okay, this is my studies it will be ended, you know. There is no way I will pass a TOEFL exam. It's an English test. Uh, because I, have, I don't know English. For me, it was the same, English or Chinese. That doesn't make difference, you know. Uh, and uh, I went to this TOEFL place and they gave me a thick, you know, uh, uh, stack of papers that I need to pass. Uh, and what I understood that there are questions and few answers. And one of them was true. All others false. So I just prayed and said, Lord, I don't know why you brought me here, you know. I have no clue how I'm going to study here. I don't know English. So I just took a pen and randomly just circled, you know, uh, <laughs> this... Uh, all, I completed this test for five minutes, you know. <laughs> Normally, it takes two hours. <laughs> so I just, you know, uh, left my test, and I went place where I stayed to pack my suitcases to go home. 
In two days, I received an envelope in the mail. And I open up, uh, and it's in English. I have no clue what's going on there, you know. <laughs> so I asked my friend who knew English, and I said, could you interpret it for me? And he was reading and laughing. I said, why are you laughing? He said, well, they say that they're so impressed with your knowledge of English language, <laughs> and you received highest score that is possible. <laughs> So they accept you to Moody Bible Institute. <laughs> and I was shocked from one hand. I was happy. It was a miracle from the Lord. But from another ha uh, hand, I was scary. Because, okay, I passed this test. But how in the world I will study, you know, read books, write papers, do other exams in school. But I knew that everything is possible for God. Because God is the Lord of impossibility. So I went to Moody Bible Institute. I was sitting in the classroom and uh, waiting. I was, I, I, I was thinking that I will get a gift of tongue, you know, English. <laughs> English. Uh, and I was accepted to receive, like, like in the day of uh, Pentecostal, you know, the, I, I was accepted to receive this gift of English, you know, language. Uh, but nothing happened. <laughs> I, I, and, and I have no clue. I even didn't know what name of this class, you know. And I was sitting there, and it, it, it was a master's program. It was master at the uh, in the MABS program, a Master of Arts in Biblical Studies. And I was sitting there, and suddenly I got a thought from the Lord. And, and, and God just, you know, talked to my heart, and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I don't know, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I have no clue. I, I have the same question, you know. <laughs> what am I doing here, you know? And... And I said, well, I don't know. And, 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 and God you know, put, uh, talked to my heart that you need to do something. Because God, you know, he, he would like to help. But he is not going to do instead of me. So I need to do something that he will be help. And I said, okay, Lord, I understand. So I talked to my, you know, I find a, an American friend. And I ask his notes. And I just Xerox copies, you know, his notes. And I will go home, and I had like huge English-Russian dictionary, and I would translate it every single word and memorize it. Mm. Uh, and then I find uh, Bible in uh, tapes in English. So I will read one chapter in Russian, then try and read same chapter in English, and then listen same chapter, you know, uh, in English. And this is what I was doing every single day. Uh, the, the good thing is they they put all deadlines to the end of the semester. So I had three months to learn English. And you know, God is good. It was hard, you know, I was working hard. I had headache for two years, you know. <laughs> uh, but God has made another miracle in my life. So I was able, in the end of the semester, I was able to read books and I was able to pass tests. And pray the Lord, I graduated Moody Bible Institute with stray A's. Wow. And uh, it's just because of him, not because of me. So I was so relieved and I was happy to go home, you know. Uh, but suddenly I got a phone call from Dallas Theological Seminary. And they invited me to continue my education in the master's program and THM program, Master of, Masters of Theology. And it's Greek and Hebrew, you know, on the top of English, <laughs> plus texting, y'all, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. Uh, and I was said, oh, no, Lord, thank you, but I cannot. I got, I got sick from all these studies, you know. And in these days, you know, the Soviet Union was broke down, and again, Ukraine became to be independent, and we got freedom for Christians. And I, I, I'm eager to go to preach gospel, not sitting here with the books, you know. And I said, Lord, this, if this is your will, please show me something unique. So I will be know clearly that I need to go to Dallas. Because I had no desire to go study again for four years, you know. And, you know, next day I got a phone call from Dallas Theological Seminary. And they said, please come to study in our seminary. And if you will come, we will cover all your expenses. Wow. You know, tuition and living expenses, all expenses. Wow. And this was unusual, you know. So I understood this. This is from the Lord. And even I don't like to go like Jonah, you know, or, or, or Moses, you know. I said, okay, Lord, if it's your will, I am going. So 
during this time, my family came to me. It was another miracle. It, uh, and we, so we went to Dallas Logical Seminary, and I finished THM program, and then I finished doctoral program, and, uh, and still alive. Wow. <laughs> Pray the Lord. And so, so eventually when you were all done, you were here about 10 years, you, you went back to Ukraine, and you started pastoring your church. Tell us about that. And, and then also... Uh, you took a leadership uh, at the right. seminary, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, well, I, when I finished my THM program in Dallas, I went to Ukraine, and I was studying my doctoral prog program. I was just uh, commune, you know, come back and forth at summertime. I, I took uh, summer classes. Okay. Yeah. So here's, here's a couple pictures of, of uh, the church, uh, maybe number six and maybe number two. We'll, we'll show those photos just so you have an idea of what the church looks like. And they're, they look just like us, right? Just yeah. yeah. Lots of people. Number two is also. Yeah, this is women's Bible study. Let women's us, Bible let study. Us yeah. Right. And then uh, did we show the picture of the graduates? I don't know. Did we show that? Number seven? Yeah. And number, number nine. Right. So how did you end up here? All right. So February 24th. Take us back to February 24th. And how did you end up in Southern California? Uh, in the beginning of this year, we heard lots of news was going on in Ukraine and probably not only in Ukraine, that war could start. But nobody believed in Ukraine war would start because, you know, we've been always uh, thinking, uh, hearing about that Russia would like attack us. And Russia in uh, 2014 uh, already got some peace from Ukraine, you know, east part of Ukraine. And when they talk about they're going to attack Kiev, nobody believed in this. And the date, February 24th, when during the night I was sleeping and I heard some noise going on outside. And when I heard, uh, I wake up and it was so strange noise. I never heard this before. And I was thinking, maybe this is in my dream. And second time I heard, and I wake up eager. I said, eager, I think they're bombing us. Nothing was, uh, you know, thinking, n nothing around uh, was saying that war could be start. And after a few uh, bom uh, bombing, uh, we wake up and we decide to go because we live in an uh, apartment building where it's 25 floors and we are in 12 floors. It's not really the safest place to be when I attacked. And we look in the window and we saw so many cars in the highway starting moving. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. And after we packed our stuff, we just packed like our backpack. It's all because we were going to the seminary, our seminary in Irpen, and we have lots of students there because uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we were teaching there, and Thursday was coming, and we were supposed to go teach. And we just took a close what we need for the uh, seminary. And instead of driving 20 minutes, we drove two, two and a half? Yeah, two and a half hours because it was so crowd. Only like in 30 minutes, the crowd was so huge. Everybody wants to leave. Uh, country. Everybody wants to leave yeah. the city. And when we came to Irpen, the seminary students was all awake, and we were thinking Irpen would be a more quiet place and peaceful place because it's not a capital. But later on, when bombing started near Irpen, we find out that the uh, main military base is uh, two miles from Irpen. It's the city of Hastomel. And we had a chapel in the morning. Igor was preaching in the chapel. And during the chapel, we heard again bombing. And this is when uh, you probably could take it. Yeah, and uh, during the chapel, we hear, you know, we hear the bombing. Everybody kneel down and we pray and ask God protect, for protection. And later on, we ask all students to go to the uh, we go basement and we are pray, continue to pray there. And we are thinking what kind of decision we should make. And all students would like to go back home to be with their families. Some of them didn't go because uh, there were no way to go anymore. And we stayed for them for a few weeks. And when government and like uh, uh, mayor of the city, Irpen, said it, uh, the best way for civilian to leave the Irpen because it's dangerous to be, they asked us to, uh, to do evacuation. And we were thinking to go back to Kiev and get our stuff, but we were not able to go because nobody were allowed to go back to Kiev and also the bridge which would take us from the Irpen to the seminar, uh, to, uh, to our home was destroyed. And we decided to go just, we took a car and we started to drive. And it was not easy to drive because uh, uh, gas 
was so lack of gas, you know, you drive a few miles and you want to put some gas, but uh, a gas station was filled with people because there was not enough gas. And they were given like one or two gallon gas and you drive again, you stay in line for a few hours. And normally it's take from Kiev to drive to Lviv about six hours, but it took us 18 hours. We came there, we stayed with our students' family, and we were thinking we'll be staying there for a while. But because they start bombing in Lviv too, and I uh, look in Igor and I find out, he said, uh, Lena, I feel like I'm back in the war in Afghanistan. And I don't want that this feeling will be staying with us. And we heard uh, there are a train, we could evacuate it to Poland. And we were thinking it would be, you know, just take a train to go, because we've been traveling train before a lot. And we came to, Lviv, uh, to the train station in Lviv, and we were shocked. And how we were shocked, you could see the huge crowd of people, everybody wants to leave the, uh, uh, Ukraine. And uh, instead of, you know, like before you have to have a ticket there, nobody needs to have a ticket. You just try to get in inside the train. And and you're, in, this, you're in there somewhere. And you could yeah. see in this crowd, uh, we were there. At yeah, uh, that time, they were allowed only women and kids leave the country. Men were not allowed. Only men after 60 years old. And I said, Igor, this is the first time you are happy to be over 60. <laughs> <laughs> it, it pays to have gray hair and be old, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, and you know, it was just a nightmare. Everybody trying to go in. And you see it's much more people than train can hold it, you know. So people were screaming and children were crying and everybody was squeezing and everybody, it's like Titanic, you know, and everybody in panic. They left their suitcases, they left their stuff, you know, just trying to go in. So it was, you know, like, I, I thought they will kill me, you know, in this crowd because it's so, it, it was so much pressure. And uh, we left, uh, we missed one train and another train Then Lena was able to go to the train, but, uh, but not me. So she left uh, to Poland, and I stayed in Ukraine. And that's because you became separated, separated. Yeah, in the crowd, the crowd, right? Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. Uh, separated in the crowd. And I thought I will never see her again, you know, because there is no communication. My phone died. Uh, I don't have any charger, you know, to charge phone. And uh, I thought I will be never able to make it to the train, you know. So I left another one and another one and another one. And then last train, it was just a miracle from the Lord that I, I, I uh, you know, I w went in and I was standing in the hallway for, uh, if Lena was in this train for uh, 28, hours. 28 hours standing up. No food, no bathroom, no, no no water. They just stopped in the woods and let people go to the woods, you know, not to the bathroom, but just to the woods, you know. In the train, you know, all these mother were crying because they knew that some of them would never see their husband. And it was so hard for the mother with three, four kids to be in the train, carry them, kids crying, they're hungry and leave everything what they had. They had like backpack like we are. It's all what they have. In a, uh, mo most of the chair, instead of one person, would be three, four person uh, uh, sitting there. But who, who didn't have kids, they have to stand there for 28 hours. But we are so happy, even in this difficult 28 hours, we are so happy to be in safe place. Well, you yeah, stood yeah. up in the train in for the train, 28, hours. 28 hours. You couldn't sleep, no, there are no bathroom facilities. No on the train, yeah. no food? No food, you know. Uh, no. And when we arrived to, uh, when I arrived to uh, Poland, uh, I was staying at a train station and people were offering to stay, uh, to place to stay and I said, I cannot go anywhere. I have to see if my husband is coming because I didn't have any communication and for uh, 48 hours, I was waiting until Igor come, but I didn't know when he will come or if he will ever come. Every train when arrived, I was looking and searching if my husband is there. And when he arrived, he asked uh, somebody in Poland if they could borrow the phone, and he called me in Viber, and he said, I arrived. And it was, yeah. <laughs> we are praising God for this. Yeah, yeah. pray the Lord, pray the Lord. But you, you know what is interesting? When I was in this train, standing up for 48 hours, no sleep, no food, I had opportunity, opportunity for ministry because together with me, uh, we had a group of Muslim guys. Uh, they were students in Kyiv, in Ukraine. One guy were, one for, was from Syria, another from Pakistan, another from uh, uh, Iraq. But I've been in mission trips in these countries. So I started to talk with them in English because they didn't speak Russian. 
And uh, they were so happy to, to hear somebody who speaks English, you know. And I was telling them that I've been in their places and I've been there in their countries. And we had this beautiful conversation. And they were talking about Bible, about Quran, about similarity, you know, uh, between Bible and Quran. And, and they were so, uh, uh, they, they were listening to me. And so I was preaching with them for 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long service and locked audience, you know. <laughs> you cannot move anywhere, anywhere. Uh, but pray the Lord that God gave me this chance, this opportunity to witness these guys, you know, even in these difficult circumstances. Let me, I want to show you a video, all right, before I ask you the next question. We found a video on YouTube, and we kind of did some editing to shorten it up a little bit, of, of what exactly was going, in, going on in Irpin, which is your city, right, which is where the seminary is located. So uh, take a look at this. очень разбомблен. Это просто трэш. Такой красивый был город. Вот. Что, что больших домов, что частный сектор. Это просто дома горят. Это ужасно. Короче. Два дня мы вообще с подвала не выходили. То так хоть выходили, а то вообще была очень большая бомбежка. How does, um, how does it make you feel when you see that? I wish it would be the last video of the war. But right now, so many people like this running from the country, running from the place where they're fighting. Right now, in this time, we are sitting here and just see this. But right now, lots of people need, need prayers because they're trying to flee for 60 days from the bomb shelters. The place Irpen, Bucha, and uh, Gastomon, it's all of them really close. They are free from Russians right now. But they pay in their hearts because lots of mom and dad were killed, lots of orphan kids there, lots of women and young girls been raped, some of them pregnant right now, and all of them need your prayers. And please pray for other rest of the places who is not free from war right now. And we don't know what could happen next. Every day we hear the news and how we could survive the every news what we hear just to know, be still, you know, I'm your God. This yeah. is only one thing that could go any of us, doesn't matter where, where we live, in Ukraine or America, to remember God is in control. And we know it would be one day when God would take all our tears and pain and uh, he'll take and he will give us joy. Even now, to go through this difficulty, we could have a joy only through him. Yes, uh, and uh, you know, when we watch uh, this video, 
uh, it's just a picture, you know, what, but when you're inside, it's, it's completely different. And uh, because of this war, uh, we got lots of lessons from God. And uh, one of the lessons, it's a, it's a briefness of our life. Our life like a vapor, you know, that's what the Bible said, you know. And uh, here you are alive and you don't know what would be tomorrow, you know. Here you are comfortable and you don't know what would be tomorrow. And uh, uh, also, uh, it's a big lesson for us that God is sovereign. He is in control. And even if we don't know what's going on and uh, why God allowed this war to happen and why it's still on, but, you know, in our life we have all kind of uh, question marks for God. Why? 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 Why this happened with me? Why that happened with me? Why this happened with my child, you know? But I believe that when we, when we will be in heaven, God will collect all our question marks and strengthen them to the exclamation marks. And instead of why, we will say, wow, now I see, now I understand. But uh, right now, we need to accept whatever God is doing in our life, even if we don't understand by our brain, we need to understand by our faith, accept by our faith. This is why we are believers, because we are living by faith, not just by sight or not just by brain, you know. And uh, uh, so we have lots of lessons uh, from God because of this war. And uh, one of them that uh, we are living in the last days, that Jesus will come soon. And in the book of Revelation, he said, Behold, I am coming soon. And he said these words 2,000 years ago. It's mean today he will come 2,000 times sooner. And we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared. We need to be faithful to the Lord in spite of whatever is going on in our life. You know, most, most of us, I, don't, I think I would say 99.9% .9 of us have never heard a bomb go off. We've never been in a, in a theater of war. I mean, what, what was it really like out there? Um, you heard the bombs going off. We, we can't even imagine what that's like. What was that like when you're hearing the bombs going off? I would like that you will never hear the bomb. And it's scary. And you don't know where to go, where to hide yourself. And even after we were free, you know, like we were in Poland or even when I came to America, every time when I was here, uh, airplane flies was so scary because you all think it's probably bombing comes. And I was shared before, like uh, I went to the track with my granddaughter and when they shoot there, I was so scary because you always remember this feeling. It takes time, you know, to heal. Mm -hmm. And then you, you, you actually, I don't know if we mentioned this but, or not, but when you finally arrived in Warsaw, uh, you were able to contact your daughter who lives here. Um, you tell us a little about that and how you ended up here. And because we had a visa, uh, our daughter lives here. She was so worried about us. She prayed for us. She was so uh, glad to hear that we are in Poland. And she said, Mom, I'll find the tickets for you, and Ma you could come. And we were waiting for a few days, like we were in Poland, for six days until uh, she sent us tickets, and we were able to come. Uh, our daughter lives in Santa Clarita because she was studying Master's College and met Ryan Smith. Uh, so, and, and, and she got married, and now we have Mr. and Mrs. Smith in the family. <laughs> and we have two beautiful uh, grandkids. Yeah, Mila, she's eight, and Lucas, he's six. So, we are happy to be here in safe place, and uh, also we are happy to see our grandchildren. You know, go ahead. You know, uh, uh, also what I would like to say that uh, because of the war, our life perspective changed, you know, because... Uh, very often we are so busy with all these earthly things, but when war happened, you know, we left everything. We left our home, we left our cars, we left our stuff, everything. And we came to America with empty hands, happy that we are alive. And it's like a preparation to go to heaven because we cannot take anything with us to heaven, you know. So it makes your perspective of life. Uh, priorities, what is first supposed to be. This is why God said, seek the kingdom of God first, and then everything else, everything else. So it's, you know, when, uh, when it's happened like this, you, you're, you're changing your mind's uh, sets, you know, and, uh, and you're, th you're thinking differently, and you look, uh, your look on, uh, on life differently than it used to be. Yeah, well, you, they were telling me that the first place that their daughter 
uh, Victoria took them to after they arrived was to Costco to buy some clothes because they didn't have any clothes. And uh, so it, it, it does change everything. You know, I, in, in a message probably about a month ago, I showed a picture of uh, a young man named Anatoly. I found this story online, uh, 26 years old. Maybe you could show that uh, slide, number 14. I think the photo I showed of Anatoly was the one on, on the, the top left. 26 years old, he was really involved in a media ministry at his church, and he was killed when he was helping a young mother and her children across that bridge that connected Urpin and Kiev that was blown up, and he was killed. They were all killed uh, when a, a mortar went off, um, and when I showed this picture, when I told you about this story, you told me that you know this young man. Right. Yes, I know this young man, and I know his father. Uh, both of them with the Lord, you know. But uh, uh, you know, it's amazing that uh, they've been in Donetsk, and because of Russian invention, they they moved. For, they they they, ref, they were refugees from Donetsk to Irpen, because Irpen is was safe place. Eight years ago. Eight years ago. So they moved from Donetsk to Irpen, and they got killed in Irpen. You know. Uh, so. Uh, but uh, Anatoly, uh, his father, he was a part of music band, and very often we were traveling together. I was preaching, and they were singing songs, uh, and we were doing outreach, you know, evangelistic uh, services. So, yes, we know them. And it's not only Anatoly. We have in Mariupol five young men. They're helping also in a car, moving people, you know. From evacuate people. Evacuate people. And all of them, five were killed. Three of them are students, too. So Mariupol is, is now under siege, and so uh, they're not even allowing any relief to go into that city to help the people, so please pray for that. And I just want to say one other thing. You know, I, I know that there's some people in our church uh, who are Russian descent, and Russian people are not bad. You know, it's the leaders that are bad. And so don't, don't discriminate against somebody who is Russian simply because you connect them to what's going on in the world today. And so we, we often do that. We do that a lot, right? So um, is, is God still good? Yes, God is good. Yeah. All the time. All the time. Yeah. I'm going to give you the last word. Anything you'd, you'd want to say to our church? I mean, yeah. consider us your, your church. Um, and, and your church, by the way, oh, yeah, I want to ask you this. Your church is now scattered, right? Your, yeah. And your students are scattered. Right. G give me just real quick your your perspective on that. Well, uh, you know, like in Book of Acts, we see when persecution started in the first church, and church was spread around the Roman Empire, and as a result, it was church pl church planting process, you know, in the Roman Empire, and this is how Christianity became to be in different parts of the world. So right now we can see the similar picture. Uh, Ukraine is like a Bible Belt. For, for all Soviet Union because uh, evangelical Christianity started from Ukraine. And we have more Christians in Ukraine, evangelical Christians, than in all Europe and all Russia together. And now we have lots of refuge, refugees, like uh, five million. Five million Ukrainians went to Europe and lots of Christians people, they went to Europe and, and they spread everywhere in the European countries because Europe is spiritually dead now, you know, and it's going down. And this is why God sent Ukrainians to Europe to make a revival in Europe, you know. So, yeah. as I said, we don't know all pictures. We see just certain puzzles, but God knows and he is good. He is yeah, always good. That's good. Just like in the book of Acts, the church spread throughout the world because of persecution. So could it be that God is using the war to get the, the only place in Europe where there are Christians is really Ukraine. I mean, most of Europe is spiritually dead. And could he have used this? Is he using this to spread Christ followers from Ukraine to spread the gospel throughout Europe? So I hope that'll be great insight for you and change the way you pray. Pray for the believers in Ukraine as they've spread out all over Europe, that they will be a light for Jesus and that Europe will come to know Christ as a result of this. Any final words for us, the, the church? Yeah. What would you like to say to us? Well, I, uh, I would like to encourage you to continue to pray for our country, for our people, that God will stop this war and that many people will come through all this hardship to the Lord, you know, and accept Jesus as their personal Savior. And also I would like us 
to, uh, to pray the prayer of faith. You know what this prayer of faith is? When, uh, when we say, the Lord, my answer is yes. So now, what is your question? My answer is yes. Just let me know what is your question. So may God bless you and uh, help all of us to stay faithful to the Lord to the end. Amen. Amen. Because Thank you. he is coming soon. Amen. Thank you so much. Let's all stand, okay? Let's all stand and pray for the Rumchucks. Yeah, you can pl applaud them. And <laughs> you, you can see why I just fell in love with them. They're, they're so warm and so loving. I feel like they're just a part of our congregation, and, and you really are. You're part of our church. And so let's pray for them. And, and I just want to reiterate what he said. You know, I believe the Lord, and we believe the Lord's coming soon. So if there was ever a time to get serious about God, it is right now. It is today. Stop messing around. Stop being on the fence. Get hot for Christ. Follow him with everything you have because he's coming real soon. And if you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, do that. He did that as a soldier flying a, in, in a in a in a helicopter trying to shoot down, you know, Taliban. And uh, he came to Christ because of it, and it's been with him this whole time. God is real. God is real. So if you never have, give your life to God. Just tell God, I believe in you. I believe Jesus was your son, and that will begin to change your whole life. All right? So let's pray for them. If you're comfortable, you want to extend your, your hand toward them as just a show of our support for them. You can do that even if you're watching out under the tent or online, just Extend your hand to them, and, and let's pray for them and lift them up. Well, Father God, we, we are just so blessed today that for all the things that you have done to protect and to preserve and to use Pastor Igor and Lena in the way that you have, Father, you, you, you didn't make a mistake when, when a long time ago you, you got him a full ride and you got him through, through Moody and then you got him a full ride to to Dallas Theological Seminary that, that he would go on to be used by you in the ways that he has. And Father, I believe that you have a plan for every one of us to use us to be the light right where you've planted us. But Lord, right now, we want to lift them up to you and ask God for your favor to continue to be upon them in a powerful way. Father, we pray that their, the, your favor upon them will allow their, their ministry to grow and their boundaries to be widened and increased. God, so that even while their church is scattered, even while their students and their seminary uh, have been scattered, their, their seminary has been destroyed, Father, we pray that you'd bring good out of that. We pray that more people throughout Europe, throughout the entire continent, will come to know you because of what has happened to Ukraine. And Father, use and anoint, bless Pastor Igor's leadership, that he would know how to lead through a time like this. Thank you for his beautiful wife, God. And we pray that you would use her as well. Father, thank you that they're able to take refuge here in Southern California for a short while. But I know that, that they can hardly wait to go back. And, and we can't wait to go back with them. So, Father, bless them. And, Lord, we lift up Mariupol, which is under siege today. In fact, we lift up that entire nation. Lord God, it's going to take a divine intervention on your part to stop this war. I pray that you would do whatever, we pray you would do whatever you can do to stop this war. Get a hold of the leaders. Father, intervene in some powerful way that all this destruction and all this killing can stop. And Lord, for all those believers that have been, have, that have been scattered throughout Europe because of this war, Lord, you, use them right where you've put them, whether they're in Italy, whether they're in Bulgaria, whether they're in Germany, whether they're in Poland, Use them to be a light for you. Shine brightly through them, Lord, and use this to build churches all throughout Europe. Thank you for the leaders that Pastor Igor has been building there. Now use these leaders, God, to start churches right where you've planted them. And Lord, use us right where you've planted us. Lord, help us to appreciate all that you've given us, the lives that you've given us. We are so blessed Father, help us not to take anything for granted anymore as we can realize through their story that everything can be taken away. And really, when it gets right down to it, we have nothing in this world. We have nothing in this life except you. 
So help us to be fully devoted to you. So thank you, Father, so much. We love you. We love this couple. We lift them up to you in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you, guys.